Hey guys, welcome to another OJ Health Radio. I've got awesome guests right here, but before we go into this, you've probably been seeing me post about my female health reboot. Now, there are actually a few people signed up to it now, but we're starting on the 4th of January. I think it's very important just to get this out there, especially this time of year, that, and it's probably something that we'll talk about, is that a lot of people seem to fall off around the holiday season and there seems to be that all or nothing approach. One of the things that I've really, really found helps is having a plan for after the holidays. So 4th of January, we'll have a free female health reboot where we're gonna take six weeks in a Facebook group, having live calls to really get the foundations of your health on track for 2021. But today, I'm joined by Sam Caps. Now Sam, you're like a man of many talents. Don't be embarrassed about it. Stop that imposter syndrome straight away. Yes, if you say so. Yeah, we've, we've got, so you're personal trainer, mm -hmm. artist, and business? Yeah, I've got my... Business got, owner? Uh, potentially, soon, yeah. Yeah, you are. Yeah, but this, this time next year, I'd like to think I can... Well, you're going to say the old boy thing then. This yeah. time next year, we'll be millionaires. I, yeah, literally, I think, I think this time next year, um, I'd like to think like, I could comfortably say those things you just mentioned. But I think I'm in the process of like finding my feet in those sort of areas. Yep. Um, personal trainer, I've been a personal trainer for qualified when I was 20, 23. Yep. For about three years. Uh, actively worked as a PT for about a year and a half and uh, do a few clients uh, here and there outside of um, employment, outside of like, um, like a gym, mm -hmm. um, just doing lockdown, things like that, which is good. So I've sort of been dabbling in a few different things, which has been really nice to sort of explore different avenues rather than sort of doing 40, 50 hours in like one, one uh, occupation. Yeah. And I think this year with the lockdown and sort of COVID, it's kind of given everybody a chance to sort of explore different things and sort of analyse what's working, what's not working and sort of explore different passions. And I think it's just trying to find out how can you fit all that into one sort of, one sort of picture and see what works. So that's kind of what I'm doing, just experimenting a lot and, uh, who knows what next year will bring, but I like that intro, man. If I can say that about myself next year, then and then I'll be happy with that. I think it's having the confidence, isn't it? Because like, at what point do you actually become a business owner? People could say with me that I'm a one-man band, mm -hmm. but then there's different things with people helping me in different areas. So mm -hmm. am I technically employing people, or at the point I've got a tax return, mm -hmm. I've got a business? Mm -hmm. But even before then, like, even if you've got a non-profit business and stuff like that, mm -hmm. right, at what point do you become? It's having that confidence. and. One of the things that uh, me and Sam are connected majorly on is that first off, like in Norwich, people know each other. Mm -hmm. Now we hadn't connected so since um, October. We started yeah, yeah, yeah October. October. So we started that uh, Sam and Remy, uh, who you'd seen from the previous podcast, and I've known Remy since since first school. That's pretty crazy when we think of it like that. And like we've been in and out of contact, and he was on the podcast before with Tom. And then also your friends with Matt Sykes as well, who was yeah. on the podcast before that. And it's it just a complete connection when it comes to, there's an event, or a, what do we call it, Bro Society event? A, a gathering? Um, like a little, a, society. a little movement really, yeah. to be honest. So the, there's a movement called Bro Society. Now, I'll let you explain what it is. So essentially Remy, Remy ran it last year in Norwich. I think him and Louis um, started it and then just, with other commitments, it didn't really, it didn't really sustain itself. I think they're two very, very busy people, so we were a lot going on. So it kind of um, stopped running with COVID as well and the lockdowns, um, and obviously everybody happened to isolate. And uh, I heard about it, and me and Remy touched on it a few times, and I thought it was a massive opportunity and, mm. and so needed. Like it was really interesting because it's the kind of thing I would have loved to have created myself. However, I just don't think I would have plucked it out of thin air. So the fact that it was kind of dormant and laying there and had the potential to just be reignited. And I think I had a little bit more time and sort of energy to give towards it than the other guys. But obviously Remy's been pretty much involved the whole time as well, which has been awesome because I thought maybe it might be something which I do independently um, based on how busy Remy's been. But, but luckily he's been there every time. So essentially it's like a men's mental health talking group. So it's essentially like creating a safe space for guys to sort of gather in a room um, with confidentiality but we're not going to sort of whatever is said in the room stays in the room and it's just a space for guys to listen to each other like vent and just express how they're feeling because I think I think in the society we live in everyone's so busy and everyone's wanting like 
sort of material gain all the time. So I'll listen to your problems, but only if you give me 50 quid for the yeah. hour. Do you know what I mean? And then there's obviously there's that bias of thinking, well, they don't actually care about what I'm going to say because they just want my money. Yeah. So the idea of Bro Society is it's like, it's completely free. Um, it's just put on in our spare time. It's just a chance for guys to come gather locally in Norwich or Norfolk and uh, just chat really. We're not there to sort of tell anybody how to live their life. It's just an opportunity for someone to be heard and they can, we have an item that everybody holds and we go around in a circle. It's just like a sharing circle. It's a very basic idea, but it's something that isn't really promoted in our society um, anymore. I think back when we lived in more sort of communities and tribes, I think connecting with other people outside of sort of your occupation was probably more more common. So I think there's not really a chance for people get to talk to each other about how they're really feeling, other than your sort of intimate relationships and family. Um, and if those connections aren't there, they don't exist or they're, they're poor, then where do people find that release? So yeah, I think you've got those relationships, mm. but you can't necessarily talk to the people with things that they're pitching you off about. Too close to home. Yeah, it's too exactly. close to home. Yeah, especially if you're living with certain people and things like that. Um, family dynamics are really, really complex. I think we all can kind of agree on that if you do a bit of reflecting on your own your own relationships and your family and stuff like that. And um, yeah, it's just basically a chance for sort of people outside of the picture to just maybe give you some sort of objective um, validation really for sort of what you're experiencing. No one's there to sort of give advice. However, that does sometimes organically happen, yeah. which is great. Um, and a bit of support from other men is really really um, valued from what's happened so far. So I think it's been running since October time, fortnightly on a Wednesday. And um, yeah, it's really, it's been really powerful to sort of sit back and watch it unfold whilst people are sharing and just seeing how important it is for some people just to literally express their story or yeah. what's been going on in their life. And I think it's been really powerful because I've been to everyone, I think I missed one of them when, when, since it started, but. Mm we had the second lockdown. Mm -hmm. Now, luckily in one of the actual guidelines, it was that you could have up to 15 people yeah. for support groups, for mental health, for depression, all these different things, mm -hmm. for support groups essentially. So, but, and we confirmed that because one of the guys that actually is there is a policeman. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or has been there as a policeman. And so we're always making sure we are trying to follow guidelines regardless of people's beliefs of what's going on at the moment. And I think that month, I know it definitely has helped me, mm -hmm. but, the other people that are there that they've been cut off potentially from a lot more people again mm -hmm. even though it's only for four weeks but a lot of uncertainty and it's, it's really helped and it's crazy when you say about we do get coaching stuff in there yeah. but we don't mean to yeah and i think i messaged you after the last one because we went deep into discussion with one of the guys about music and oh, that was probably the most powerful like that last meeting so powerful yeah there was there was four of us there wasn't yeah. there like a couple of people had gone and then I message you like, I feel like I was giving coaching to this guy. Mm. And you don't mean to, but as a coach, mm -hmm. you do. And we've had discussions about coaching as well. Like, should coach you, like, yeah, be free and stuff, like when you're trying to offer a service and all that sort of stuff. Like, it's difficult because you're battling with the society we're living in, right? Yeah. Like, everybody, like, from a survival basis, we all need resources and money to function, to live and cooperate with everybody. But then, obviously, we want to be nice people at the same time and sort of have conscious relationships with people but I think you just got to have one foot in one foot out do you know yeah. I mean? so I think with coaching I think as long as it's consensual do you know what I mean you're not sort of manipulating people and things like that and it is sincere then you should receive a a reward for the service you're giving right you don't go and work as a waiter and be like oh, I just really want to help people but yeah. I don't need to get paid for it I think that was one of my justifications like you, you do this job and yeah you want to help people out by doing that but you're not doing it free like we do have to pay the bills essentially with it. And uh, the cool thing about the guys that are there mm -hmm. um, and uh, anything that comes up, like we'll admit, we've got our WhatsApp group, we'll admit if something did knock us a little bit. I've never felt safe in a group to say that before. Mm -hmm. So like when the coaching thing came up and then I said about, oh, it made me rethink, I'm like, am I actually worth charging what I charge and all that sort of mm -hmm. stuff? Let me just have a discussion about it. And it comes up. And um, one of the cool things is that like, I know Rem, and even though he still looks like about 16, he's a year days. younger than me. And like, we went there and you were the youngest one, I think, in the first one. Yeah. And, like, this guy's speaking like probably quite ahead of his time. Like, I wish I spoke like that when I was 26, right? 25 at the time. Yeah, clinging on to that. Yeah, <laughs> clinging on to that. No, you're 26 now. Yeah, 26 Definitely now. 26 now. Can't get away from that. But just actually like 
what has been a big part in your journey to get you to where you are now? Um, questioning why things are why things are the way they are. And I think that's from a trauma, I'd say. <clears throat> but I didn't really know it's trauma until I get older and look back at it. So essentially, my mum has had a real bad battle with mental health for entire pretty much since her entire life really and she's had a very tragic emotional story just yeah. like many women have and then my parents got my parents started when I was nine so I lived with my mum and my younger brother by four years and then it was kind of just like I just had to sort of grow up around a really heartbreaking story of my mum and grow up very personally intimately linked into that and intertwined yeah. into that story so I don't really think I had the freedom to kind of just be nurtured and developed and then just go off into the world and find my own path it was very much like intertwined with my mum's uh, tragic story which is really heavy when I look back at it but it's also made me very mature at a young age I think I had to basically not take I think I probably subconsciously took on the, the role of man in the house mm -hmm. um, on an emotional level let's just say so instead of you your parents looking after you when you're a kid which i think is a, the healthy dynamic that's the normal dynamic is more a little bit like i took the role of like carer or like fixer or like um from an emotional point of view so i kind of it's like emotional um sacrifice so that's kind of why i'm a little bit more let's just say like old soul or like a little bit oh, yeah because I've been so intimately uh, connected to someone that's been suffering for so many years and then I'm thinking well, why is it like this why is my mum not just like happy and then you have to go into that I mean it's like the connection with your mother is so so fundamental because we come out of our mum right so it's like it's such a touchy subject for people because their relationships with their parents are pretty much what shape us essentially yeah. they're my caregivers right and I think the biggest step for most people, which I've heard a few people kind of say, they found this out later on in life, but hopefully we we all understand this, like your parents are humans. Yeah. But when you're a kid, like they are your gods, because they are responsible for your entire well-being, your entire environment, your nurturing, your development, everything, how you relate emotionally, everything. So I think I look back and I sometimes damn my experience and sometimes sort of resent it, but then I realise it's actually you can always look at everything in two ways. You can sort of resent it and hate it and judge it and blame it. Or you can try and find the seed of like wisdom in it or like the growth. So I think that's kind of my background. So that's why mental health is kind of close to home. I mean, I've discovered for years that I was probably depressed and I didn't really know because I didn't really know how I felt because I was so fixated. My emotions kind of went out the window when I was a kid. Like I didn't really feel anything and a few major life events happened at, in the home and stuff and that, that kind of probably just uh, hook line and sinker like probably just like shattered my heart so deeply that I just numbed out I mean that's what most men you see in society like that so disconnected from their heart because they've been hurt and they've been told by the, me the male conditioning in our society that it's weak to show emotion and things like that so then you grow up seeing these people that are like hyper masculine and overbalanced one way or toxic masculinity and stuff like that when essentially it's people that are so scared of being vulnerable because there's usually shit happens to a lot of people so they want to keep that locked away but I think I'd like to think that I'm trying to turn my pain into a gift if that makes sense yeah this is something obviously with my story I've resonated with um, mm. like with my dad dying when I was 15 mm. well first off that was that lock away period and it yeah. took about four or five years of literally being going to food and like music was a big thing in there, but no matter anything I do at the moment, nothing is going to bring my dad back. And okay, it's been 20 years next year, mm. uh, nothing is going to bring him back. But you can either still play a victim to that, or I can use it to work with the people I work with and try to make a positive impact, not just in the client's life, but in their children's lives. Because like, I was that child. So one of the things that came up before I think we've said about it is that someone challenged me and said well you've not got kids you don't know what it's like to raise kids I said no but I know what it's like to lose a parent at 15 and I said chances are like to me that's more powerful to have been in that child position so it's, it's crazy when you say about switching that have you found like 
the like, because I'm looking deeper and deeper into more like masculine and feminine energies, mm-hmm. and the role. I actually had this conversation in the call just before you came around with my clients and talking about feminine energies, two women there and how they're really caring for their kids and that mm-hmm. connection we have with our mums, mm-hmm. like potentially like over our dads and I'm just like I don't necessarily know, hundred percent of that connection because my connection with my dad was fifteen years. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I still, I'm still connected to them, but sure. obviously, like the the role model part. Mm-hmm. But um, how societal norms have gone from men have these specific jobs, women have these specific jobs. Now we still need to have some sort of balance in our like masculine and feminine. Mm-hmm. If not, you have that major clash. Yeah. But then a lot of guys have gone straight over to their feminine side. I've I've been guilty of this in the past. Yeah. And some women have gone over to their masculine side. Like, what have you seen? change potentially with that what are your views on it um it's a very very deep question yeah it? what we don't talk about in society we talk so about we don't have a plan business career. Like yeah um but i think at the end of the day it's the polarities of what attract right mm-hmm. so like it does, just because you're a man doesn't mean you're 100 percent masculine like we all have a bit of each um within us yeah um <clears throat> and it is a dance really it's like an energetic dance so it's not like a fixed I am 65% masculine yeah. energy and nothing will ever change that. Like it's going to be different in different situations, different relationships, how you relate to sort of um, in, interpersonal relationships. It's going to change all the time and you can cultivate them. Do you know what I mean? Like for example, <clears throat> I'm someone that played football all my life and then whenever I play football, I, I can channel this like hyper competitiveness and aggression. Mm. I get very gobby. Yeah. I've had multiple, like, um, discipline is quite bad for me in football if I really get involved in it. Uh, like bookings, I've never even sent off. Is that not a release? Cause yeah, that's what I'm saying, yeah. So, but then like, I've said that to people, especially in like relationships with, with, with girls and stuff, and they'll be like, oh, you're so calm and chill and stuff. And, they're like, and if I even said that, they're like, well, I can't ever imagine you like that. And I'm like, yeah, because for me, it's that's a healthy release because I can yeah. channel it within the, the domain of a game, of a sport, and I think that's why I think people gravitate to sports to sort of channel those energies. I mean, if you don't play those sports, you need other ways in which to sort of have that release. So for years, I gave up football when like life took over and I worked in like sales. I, t- I didn't, I couldn't work week. I had to work weekends. Sorry. So football went away for a couple of years, and I got more into sort of the, the bodybuilding gym scene. And I realised I didn't really have that release, that competitive. Because in the gym, like, I don't really compare myself to other people. Like I don't really. I'm not in there like lifting weights when I was a bit younger, being like, I need to be bigger than this guy next to me. Yeah. Because I don't really give a shit about that sort of stuff. But um, with football, you are actually comp- competing in a, in a game. So and I think. Team around team, you. Well. Yeah. yeah. Come on, camaraderie, teammates, people depending on you. Um, yeah, it's sort of the perfect domain, a perfect environment to sort of channel all of those sort of traits that are deemed more masculine, as you say. Um, what was the point? What was the question? You know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, so I think it's important. It's just, it's I, yeah, person. I think it's important to to just check yourself and just be like, where am I a bit overbalanced? Do you know what I mean? And I think there's the same in everything, not just masculine and feminine energies within us. But then even that term, masculine and feminine energy, like someone might hear that and be like, what a bit woo woo, like what does that even mean? But it just means like you get. I see this a lot in um, guys who have daughters you'll get like those hyper masculine kind of men and they'll have a daughter and it will really ground them yeah. and it will develop their sort of nurturing side and they'll be a little bit more like delicate and softer and it will sort of soften them and it's, that's an example of it and it means that sometimes it, it has to come from like an external um, thing like a, a daughter, a human being, like a baby and more beauty experience, and, yeah, yeah. experience and that beauty of the baby like really does something within somebody to sort of draw out that feminine side of them which is always there yeah do you know what I mean so it's just yeah it's just sort of just checking your life really I think I'll give an example of this so for me I've been highly feminized growing up with my mum because I find that I've had to be so understanding and like compassionate and, and, and naturally it's been quite sensitive internally I think that I've like absorbed so much of it and carried so much of her um trauma essentially like I've car- I felt for years I've carried her pain more than my own and I've worked so much to get through get a release a lot of that and it's been really um beautiful to do that the hardest thing ever because it's like a private journey yeah so you see people like pursuing these mad things um externally like you see people doing like pushing their bodies to massive limits and stuff like that 
which definitely was an avenue that I tried as a release. But the thing is, like, I'm I'm so accustomed to that emotional and mental pain, but I don't really want to keep seeking it out elsewhere anymore. Like, I don't want to go to the gym and destroy my body through resistance training to cope with how I'm feeling inside. It's more like I don't. I'd rather have peace. Yeah. So I think that's what I'm really happy with right now. Where. I still want to exercise and stuff, and I'm really being philosophical around my sort of attitude towards my own training and what I want to do and what serves me best and what feels good. Um, but I still understand the importance of resistance training and strength training, um, not only from a physiological point of view, but from a mental point of view and things like that, ritualistic. So I'm always sort of analysing my life and seeing what serves me, what doesn't, and um, I won't just go and do stuff without some deep thought of why I'm doing it, because yeah. everyone's got a certain amount of energy. You don't want to be like, spreading it too thin everywhere and stuff like that. So I've got to be really deliberate in what I do. Yeah, it's interesting with um on that same call, this this woman had been out of her friend and she was worried about the social distance and the numbers and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And she said, I'm not gonna do it, and then her friends peer pressured her into it. Then like her son had had a heart attack a year ago, at like 19, 20 years old. Um, and it was around she had to do some educational stuff at the hospital in that same department the day before or the day after. And then she had the stress because one of her friends got COVID Mm -hmm. who was on that walk. Mm -hmm. So she had to wait for this test. So it's like, we only have a certain amount of energy. And then she fell off the wagon when it came to food the day after, Uh, or on the night waiting for her test result. We only have a certain amount of energy we can play with before Mm -hmm. we do just fall off. Like no matter where we are, like we're in the fitness industry, the health industry, like we'll only have a certain amount of energy. You push us so much, there's going to be one sort of mechanism that we connect with and we go through. So I think it's just the awareness. One of the things that has come up for me actually, um, when it comes to the energies, I've noticed that I've found over the years that I've pushed in the gym more Mm -hmm. to try and push my masculine energy up, which I wasn't aware of that at all. Which isn't a bad thing. Yeah, (laughs) it's like- Some people need that. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Uh, And and I wasn't aware there was an energy side of thing that was going on that. But it's like, when you say about taking the anger out on your body. Mm. I've seen so many like angry people. And I think I, I noticed them more when I was that angry person mm-hmm. that I'm smashing myself in the gym. You're just beating yourself up about something. So looking into why did you become a trainer? Um, deep down, I think it, it was genuinely to help people. So I mm-hmm. think the kind of journey I went on in terms of, so when kind of shit happened to me and I grew up and I got older, I realized um, I went into the gym and I realized, oh, this is a great way to like, you know, so obviously deep down I didn't like who I was because yeah. of the stuff I'd gone, th- I'd gone through and stuff like that. And I think especially like parents splitting up or anything like that, you you internalize it and think it's because of you. But you don't, you might not think that, I was like nine years old. Yeah. Like if I met a nine year old kid, I'm like, they don't know anything. No. But when that happened, you just think, oh, well, okay. A common thought is like, I don't know, if if my parents loved me, they'd stay together. Do you know what I mean? So, because they did, and you're like, oh, obviously something wrong with me. And then you grow up internalizing that so deeply and it's unconscious, you live your life out, and then you never really gonna live your life to the first, because deep, 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 deep down, you think you're unlovable or something wrong with, wrong with you, or you're not good enough. Because your subconscious gets hold of that later. You don't even know that. Yeah, how, so how you live all your teen years and yeah. stuff, and how you interact with people, how what you think you deserve, how you put, how you put yourself across and stuff like that. And then getting into gym, because I didn't like myself fundamentally, like if, if we drew it really back, then I got into the gym and I'm like, oh shit, you can change yourself. Yeah. So I'm yeah. like, okay, but if I don't like myself, I yeah. can fucking change, change this person. So went into the gym, learned it at like 17, 18 at college, like the machines and stuff and then we did like a cyq level one and level two just like general gym exercises and stuff and when i realized oh god that i'm getting stronger on this dumbbell chest press and i'm like wow like my body's changing and then like oh like more attention from female all this sort of stuff happening i'm like oh cool like forget this inferior kid i used to be and let's just completely erase him and just try and become this new version of myself which obviously is a great thing to do transformation is important and unavoidable sometimes um, if you are sort of following following um, sort of your internal navigation system of who you, who you want to be and stuff like that, it will, it will require you to transform. But obviously what I'm doing is I'm completely abandoning myself by doing all this. 
I'm changing externally, physically, and people are responding to, me, responding to me differently. So I think from like 18 to 22, I just got so obsessed with the gym. Yeah. Changed my body, all for sort of external reasons as well, the validation from other people to look good. I need, like, I'd care more about what outfit I'd wear in the gym. I'd care about if I get a pump. I'd care about if there's a girl in the gym. All this external stuff. But I could also, at the deepest, deepest level, channel and start all my pain and stuff and do that as well. But it's just sort of coming from a point of like, I was seeking seeking this transformation so desperately and I wanted to inspire other people to do the same because I realised, oh look, I'm getting good feedback from changing my life. Yeah. And I see other people and I want that for them. Like my younger brother as well, I remember just putting pressure on him to go to the gym and I'm like, oh come on, you can do the same, you can like change and da da da. Obviously, you tell someone what to do, they're not going to want to do it. <laughs> So I told yeah. you, as soon as I stopped, more as soon as I stopped yeah. he got into the gym because he's just like, it's his own decision, which is completely fair enough. And I'm, I congratulate him for doing that and uh, ignoring me at the time. But yeah, I think the reason I became a trainer is fundamentally to sort of inspire people to realise they can be more than they are. And it literally is our birthright to sort of take on that journey of like becoming the best version of yourself. Um, but it did hit me in the face, smack in the face when I was like 22 and I realised everything I'm doing is because I don't like myself. Yeah. Everything. Going to the gym. Because at the moment you have to realise you have to not work on your body as much but not your mind. Yeah, like I had to face the music. Yeah. Like I literally had to turn around and be like, because I watched this video and it's something about like, because I got so into like self-improvement and like self-help and stuff and it's like, yeah, it's got a place and it's valid and it's 100% right but it depends on the foundation you're working from, the rock in which you build your house upon and it was so, it was like a foundation of sand because I was just like, like a fraud like yeah. the whole time I'm like trying to change my body and like I'm like oh yeah like sometimes I get this validation I feel good about myself but deep down there's like this teenage kid inside me but doesn't feel good enough and shit and it's um when I realised all that and I had to accept it I could have avoided it and could have just like I don't know got into alcohol or drugs or something it's a good thing about health and fitness is it, it, it is an addiction and it is like a escapism can be however it's applauded by society because it looks on yeah. the outside like a great thing oh you're in good shape great but I've met people, especially in the fitness industry and PTs and stuff, who are just as messed up. Yeah. But they just look like, oh, you're yeah. so fit. But you do like five classes a day, probably don't sleep, or on med hip medication, and like you've got the most mad energy ever, which all your clients love, but at the same time, you're a car crash of a person. It's actually ironic you say that. Mm. You look at my Twitter feed this morning, mm. and I said, like, unpopular opinion, one of the most, or two of the most unhealthy occupations mm. I've seen are fitness instructors and doctors. Yeah. <laughs> shift work. I'm examples of it. Yeah. Literally. I am as well. Yeah. And, and when you'd, you'd have multiple classes, you'd then train. I remember before I was working in a place where one-to-ones were free. Mm -hmm. So it was like, you couldn't charge a person training because people were getting it for free. Yeah. But you might have three people would want you to train with them in a shift. Then you had to teach spinning or something. Mm -hmm. And then you might have your own training before the shift. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no way you're going to recover from that four or five days a week. Uh, at the time, like if I tell them someone that, it's, yeah. it's hard, you get that reactive side. I know I definitely was, that, oh, I, I love doing this, especially competing in bodybuilding. Yeah. yeah, I love it, I love it. I look back now and I think, okay, that has molded me to where I am now, because mm. I had to have that to get where I am. Mm. But what a, in my opinion, horrible life that was. Yeah. Like now, looking back, looking back. yeah. Like at the time, it wasn't horrible. Uh, and then I see people like, it, it was completely like, I wasn't good enough if I didn't smash this set until I was like, or even with a client, smashing a client to the point where they can walk up the burning stairs and like get pleasure out of actually, it sounds really sophisticated, pleasure out of making someone like literally couldn't take a shit for five days because it hurt to sit on the toilet. Mm. And like now I just think that like, that's not help. Mm -hmm. and, like there must have, like as you said, that time when you switch. And so it's so interesting you say that like with the fitness fitness industry job and there's someone else that agrees with that I think when we're in it though it's hard to do it and one of the things I've had to tell some clients to do is that and I find it a lot more with women when mm -hmm. it comes to classes they might do two free classes at once yeah um, because they're seeing other people do it and it's nice socially but what that's doing to their body when we live in a stressful world anyway yeah so uh, you've gone into where did, where does art come in because some of like, the art stuff has been pretty cool to see. Where did that come from? <laughs> this is probably like the coolest, coolest thing actually. I really enjoy it. So to boil it down, um, 
my mum is really talented in terms of art and unfortunately she didn't really pursue it probably through sort of um, personal limitations and or self limits and stuff like that and uh, confidence issues and stuff based on her life story um, which is a shame but she's so talented and as a kid I loved art and I was pretty good at it at school but I gravitated towards that more than like you know people gravitate towards science or mine was sort of like football but active active stuff more football over anything else and I loved art this is probably like primary school yeah. when you get to high school and it's like unless you really identify with that and go down that route I just kind of followed football and sport and stuff and didn't really yeah. do anything so then I think everybody's not, not everybody but like nearly all of us are creative in some way it might not be like artistic pursuits but it might be sort of like through tech technology anything like that so I think everybody's creative and I think as I got older and learned more about myself I realised like god I'm so rigid I'm just doing all this physical activity and stuff and I've got no creative out there I've got no you know you see people doing stuff but you think oh I can't do that do whatever and um, so my mate Jake is a artist and I met him at David Lloyd actually it's really funny how you meet people along your journey the right at the right time yeah. Yeah. so I met him when I was at David Lloyd in 2018 and he was a member and I worked there and we um, got chatting and stuff and he did art and stuff and we connect we've got very similar views on like life and stuff and um, kind of spiritually open-minded and things like that. And um, he's got synesthesia, so he can see colour when you play music. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So when you, you play- watch Empire? No. Well, one of the so guys on there, he gets like- Has he got blown synesthesia up. or something? Yeah, he gets blown up, loses a leg, yeah. and then in that season, he, he owns a big record label. Okay. But then he starts painting his songs. Wow. Uh, it's crazy. Yeah, it's up in like the fourth, spoiler, fourth or fifth season of it. But mm. I love that because it hip hop and um, just watching that whole thing. But, it's, but I wouldn't have known what that was apart from that. Yeah, well, you well, don't. Something until, else. You, yeah. until you find it through somebody, you've no idea. It's interesting. So, like, yeah, I think so. Jake has synesthesia and he um, would play music and his favourite songs and paint to it because he can visually see it in his sensory perception which is like mind blowing yeah. um, and things like that like the nature of reality and like just what this thing is that we're even in anyway like, if you take a step back and really contemplate life and what it is that we are basically on this rock hurtling through space in a massive void yeah. it's just it's mind blowing it's not always relevant and practical to think like that but it's also quite liberating and it's important to have that perspective to sort of when things do get stressful to just take a step back and be like at the end of the day what the, no one no one knows what's going on no and it's so liberating to sort of have that viewpoint anyway so i was fascinated by this with jake and then uh we kept in touch because i lived in new zealand for a year and a half got back this year and then we kept in touch a bit over, over the time and then when i got back in this summer during lockdown um we hung out a few times and um i decided i'd love to try and paint with you one day and basically we went out to like the beach and stuff during the summer when you could go outside for like an hour or whatever it was. <laughs> it's longer than an hour, yeah. but yeah, it's supposed to be an hour. Um, so I went painting with Jay quite a few times and just tried to sort of face that voice within saying, you can't paint, you're not, you're not creative, you can't do this, stick to whatever. So I thought, right, let me just try it and do it with him. And he guided me a bit. And um, when I say guided, he probably told me to shut up when I thought I couldn't do it really more than anything yeah. so just giving me permission to sort of just try it really and I really 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 enjoyed it I think I studied a lot of psychology and stuff and then sort of left and right brain and things like that like the right brain is sort of more um intuitive and expressive and creative and um the left brain is more logical rational um uh, chronological and things like that and the left brain is the voice in your head that talks all the time and the right brain is like the quiet intuitive nudge which pushes you in different directions so I felt I was drawn to do this like drawn to sort of like try it and I just started doing it and I was like right let me stick on Instagram I'm like this is the yeah. thing we're like who am I to put a picture of me with a bit of like doing a painting but when it is your own social media do what the hell you want with it so once you get past those limitations done that and then I started to realise that this is a great conduit to sort of be quiet because art is so subjective it is subjective and it's so liberating because everything we do in life you know if you work a corporate job for example there's targets or there's a specific like role that you fulfil Everything is marked, rigid, within frameworks, within boxes, ticking boxes, um, KPIs, everything. Whereas art, obviously, is quite clear some people are better than others, but at the same time, no one's marking it. Mm -hmm. Literally, nobody's marking it. You do what you want. Dance. When you dance, no one goes, unless you're doing a specific type of dance, no one's saying it's wrong. It's just expression. Feel it, yeah. It's expression. So, like, 
the art was really liberating to try it and just get out of my head and yeah. just see what comes through. So the first few I did, I kind of had like an image or a symbol in mind, which was personal to me for whatever reason. And then as I did a few more paintings, I realised that we try and get away from sticking to making it like a picture and just see if I can just be a bit more abstract with it and stuff. But the interesting thing about doing all this is that whatever emotions I was going through at the time, whatever life chapter I was in, um, obviously it's been like seven or eight months now since, oh, since I've been back in England, it's really hard personally coming back from living abroad for a year and a half and then coming home to a lockdown, back to live with family, no car, no job, starting completely from scratch. And also after the novelty wears off of seeing friends and family again, you are just back home, back yeah. to the beginning. So it's like, okay, you have to really sort of think about where I want to go and what I want to do. But the art coincided with this journey of coming home and trying to sort of bring out a more authentic me this year um, with all the lessons I learned since going away and coming home. And the, the art has been like a massive release and my mental health improved so much uh, in relationship to doing the art. And I knew about like art therapy and things like that. And like in Jungian psychology, like Carl Jung, who was a psychologist, famous psychologist, he'd talk a lot about um, the unconscious and the imagination and things like that. And he'd say through like art therapy, you can kind of connect yourself on a deeper level. This isn't like a rational thing. You don't think about it. It's like you just have a creative expression like that. So the art has really been a nice sort of, um, not project, but like a, a hobby essentially, yeah. which I've been doing. And I've just been sharing it online. It's a cool way to sort of articulate what's going on with you or your thoughts, because the painting is just a, like a, a vehicle. So you can say, here's a painting, and but what it represents is all this stuff. Whereas if you just come out of all this stuff, it's sometimes got no context, but you can express it, put it onto a canvas, and just tell people what it means to you, or let people look at it and think that's cool, or whatever. Well, no one cares, but doesn't matter. Yeah, it's interesting as well, because as you say, it is totally subjective. So like, subjective. Some pieces of art where you think, how the hell have they sold a thousand? Like, there's no talent in that. But in reality, it's what that means to the viewer. So there's that, uh, my wife's got a picture, Laura's got a picture downstairs. I think she paid like four or five hundred quid for it. And mm -hmm. I'm just like, well, it just looks like a black canvas with a couple of like, streaks across it yeah. and it's just what does that mean and it, it's going to say something different to you depending mm -hmm. on where you are in your life right mm -hmm. um, it's interesting to see some of Remy's art at the moment yeah You're like it's like this is total expression i love his because yeah. he's he's from my understanding from what i've seen of his stuff he is essentially conveying his philosophical viewpoints on life and what's going on and whatever he's thinking about and he's putting it onto a canvas he's telling a story and like sort of projecting it onto the canvas, which is really cool. Yeah, it's, it's definitely good Good to see that. So, going back to what are the other business ideas that you don't want to say too much, people might name them, but <laughs> other business ideas, when we look at what is going to happen in the next year, let's put you under the spot. I don't know, man, I have no idea. Um, that you're going to work towards, because we don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. Like, what do you want to work towards in the next year? Okay, well, I don't want to lose sight of all the different kind of things I've got going on, rather than sort of go back into one occupation again, because, you know, society's like, get a job, da da da, da. It's like, well, at the moment, I've been functioning probably better than I have been um, in a normal job with all this stuff going on. So I don't want to, I don't want to concentrate all my energy and time into sort of like one thing and then I lose sight of bro society or I don't paint anymore or I don't run anymore and do anything like that. Spread yourself too thin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, I think I like variety. I've realised that. I think routine is very, I think there's a quote like routine, routine is lethal or something like that. It's a really good quote. I'm, I'm butchering it now anyway. But um, I've realised it's important to have structure and routine in your life. But if it is that all the time, then it can get very, like, um, very dull. So I think in certain areas when it comes to routine, like, mm. With me, it's like talking about having the similar bedtimes and wake times and morning for routines health. and stuff. Yeah, yeah for health, health reasons. Yeah. But knowing that if like flow state goes, like when, when we had our meeting before the last meeting, I think we we're there to like half ten. Mm -hmm. I'm usually in bed by like half nine. Yeah, right, it's like don't stretch yourself out if life stops you from following that to routine once or twice. Be flexible. Like, be flexible with it, but have that there. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's important. Balance, right? Yeah, we're talking about right. earlier. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's all about perception, right? In a situation like that, where you think, okay, well, I'm in a situation right now where I should be in bed based on my values and based on my, my routines. But at the same time, the importance of what's going on in that moment is probably more important than 
a couple of hours of sleep that night, extra yeah. sleep that night. So it's always sort of like a, a toss up. Do you know what I mean? But if you were so rigid in thinking, I've got to go now, blah, blah, blah. That's how I used to be though. Yeah. When I, when I was competing in bodybuilding. Yeah. Always used to be like that. Here's my meal time, here's my training time. Got to have my pre-workout then, post-workout then, bedtime then. And I, I think it's seeing both sides of it. It's like, inf- it's like, I've been doing a lot of yoga in the last couple of years and like, who probably feels better in their body? Like, think of like the biggest bodybuilder in the gym. Or think of like, a yogi. Who feels better yeah. in their body? Who's more flexible? Do you know what I mean, it's, it's better to be flexible than not. Well, yeah, and <laughs> I, I was having this conversation with someone the other day of talking about my hip flexors are really tight when I done. So we done you know the running I done the cycling yeah. in, in November. So it's four hundred miles. It used to be normal to do that amount on the mm-hmm. bike in a month, but doing it sat on a turbo trainer over there, like my hip flexors got really tight, mm-hmm. and I was wanting to really open them up, put open my hips up, and then. My friend said about, well, it's all specific, like flexibility is specific to your needs, but who needs to be able to be tight enough that they can deadlift 250, 300k and that's just your job? And then is flexibility not necessarily down to your specific health and what your goals are? So if you're going to feel better and be more flexible, but as a result, you're not as strong like for that specific task. I understand. Like, there's nothing... From the way I used to train, and to be fair, it's more like a little bit like that, it's more enjoyment. But when I look at that sort of training, how functional is it when I want to move a house? Like, it's not, well, move a house, not move a house, mm-hmm. it's a bit hard to move a house. <laughs> but yeah, like, where's the functionality in actually like putting things upstairs that are like here from your body, your center of gravity is in a different place? That's something which I'll start thinking about a bit more. I used to um, be able to deadlift like over 200 kilograms. That's- I look at it now and it's like I look a bit different from when I did that I'm definitely lighter and I think about that I'm thinking they lift over 200 kg like that's significant yeah and I think to myself but who was I at that time when I did that and I'm like I would not want to be that person yet. exactly but but I'm physically weaker probably yeah probably I'm physically weaker now but what's better the physical or mental or having the balance between yeah, you can have all the mental strength and no physical strength yeah and like, but what happens when life actually does come at you and you need to like adrenaline is gonna like we've seen some massive stories of people boosting adrenaline and they're getting like superhuman strength. But it's interesting as well, like I've seen different things of like when people are really strong and having a goal. So I trained with Eddie Hall once and that was but just that. Like, yeah, well it was weird because I was working with a company Protein Dynamics and we were both sponsored by him. And so I went up to Stoke to do a shoot with him mm-hmm. and to train and this is can you remember that he done a video where people were putting the plates on, deadlift, put another plate on, deadlift? Mm-hmm. We had to recreate that. Um, and then they said, like, make it look like you're coaching him. You're squatting like 300 odd kilos as a warm up. I'm not doing anything if he falls, yeah. I'm, I'm moving. Yeah. <laughs> How do I look like I'm coaching him? But like having the conversation with him, like his strength, like he is obviously he's been the strongest man, he's ridiculously strong now. But it was having that focus on that goal. And now I know he's got a different focus on the boxing side of things. Mm-hmm. You can see him changing for his goal for that specific task. And so strength in a way to me has been, it's all specific to what your actual goals are. Like, yeah, I'll deadlift to 300 kilos or no, sorry, yeah. 90. You beat me, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> bigger than you though. Yeah. There's also assistance there, like <laughs> anabolics in there. Yeah. But, um, and I've seen people deadlift a hell of a lot more, but, what has that got me in life? I've um, deadlifted that. Yeah. I'd love to say that I've deadlifted that. It's a nice personal goal. Yeah. That, and then I shot it down as well. We're saying I'm, I'm heavier than you and then using assistance. Yeah. Like, well, that's me shooting myself down. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's getting the PBs. And I think like shooting for new PBs for progress is good. But then what about mental PBs? And self-esteem as well. Like if, yeah. you, if you've built up to that, like I'm proud that I could do that. And I've yeah. got video footage of me doing it and that's cool. But it depends on where you place that in a value system. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like if, that's, if that's sort of like, I don't know, if you're meeting, if you were like dating or something, yeah. and you said, oh, I can deadlift 200 kilograms. It's like, well, okay, cool. Yeah. Like that might be, that might, might be a desirable, be rest, yeah. Yeah, might might be a desirable be. trait for somebody looking at part, oh, they're, they're strong, they're cast themselves, whatever. But like, how high up is it on your value? <laughs> yeah. Do you know if what you mean? treat someone like shit, then yeah. how's it actually going to get you anywhere? Yeah, exactly. So, it's um, crazy when you look at that sort of stuff. It's important to do it because, like you said, you would have you would have pushed through your own mental limitations. Like last month, that running challenge, I ran a marathon. 
Yeah, and that is... You didn't say that very much when we had one of those meetings. <laughs> I'm <was joking. laughs> It's because um, I remember uh, Louis and Remy ran an ultra back in the summer. Yeah. And they were joking, like, repeat it all the time. I like, mentioned it every opportunity. And I, and I kind of... At the time, I was like, oh, it's funny. But I didn't really get it. I like, normally didn't get it. I just didn't think about it. It wouldn't really do with me. And then since I've done one, I'm like, oh, the temptation to, to be like that. I'm not really like that anyway. I'm quite sort of um, modest. But you realise doing something like that which is pushing for a mental limitation of doing something which you didn't deem possible for you so powerful so, so yeah. it's like what deadlifting is any, any physical pursuit or mental pursuit anything like that or like even if you get a promotion and a job or you get a certain job which you didn't think you'd ever get then they're all great progress markers you know yeah it's interesting when we look at that and it got me looking at like Strava stats from when I was training for a marathon mm. before my body broke and I think because there was a challenge of run your longest ever one. Like, Saturday. Yeah. And my longest one had been 22.2 20, miles. I'm like, yeah, that ain't going to happen. Yeah. Like, not when I'm not going to be able to run 5k. I would be able to run 5k. Yeah. I'd be screwed up for 5k. Mm. Um, which is pretty crazy to think of it. As, like, it was all specific training before that. Yeah. So what are you running? What's that though? Yeah. 100. You're doing 100k. <laughs> I've got to say, haven't I got to, like, put it out that's there. a benchmark. And I'll do the best I can and see what I learn about myself and see what I can push towards. Yeah. I listened to Goggins, um, David Goggins' audiobook, finished it off last month. It was insane. Like, the limits which we have for ourselves and our own preconceived limits are literally so low. So low. Yeah. But the mental inner dialogue of, like, or the voice that tells you to stop or it's too much, like, that is literally, like, I can't remember what he said in the book, but, like, it's like a 40% rule or something. Like, like when you think you go on hundred percent, it's actually fifty. Something yes, yeah, the way that like, yeah. US Marines talk about, or yeah. SEALs talk about. I think people like Goggins, like he's, it's not like I'll go and be like him, because I, I think personally, for someone to pursue that much, I don't think he'd probably found healing for his. Uh, yeah, that's one of the yeah. things that's come up. Listen to that book; it is awesome, awesome, and like Great putting himself through that, like doing, um, like the Hell Week or whatever, like, mm. three times I think, or like twice he had like broken leg or yeah. like, shattered shin bones or whatever eight ultras in eight weeks yeah and then he'd done like the 100 miles in 24 hours or something like in order to get to a different ultra mm -hmm. like there's got to be some pain going on oh yeah so much to want to constantly push your body to that yeah. so I, like one of the guys that um i want a coaching team with um there go the dogs uh, one of the guys that i'm on a coaching team with he ran the Barkley Marathon? Have you seen that on Netflix? I don't know anything about running. So, <laughs> this is, this is a brand that it's invite, or you apply to go to it and you have. Hang on. We'll just be quiet just for a couple of minutes while. This is real life. Someone's at the door. Amazing dogs, by the way. They are cool. They're stressful at times, but then also they lower your stress at times. Yeah, I can imagine. So, better than here than not. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so there's the Barkley Marathons, and it's five loops, 20 miles, I think, or five marathons, and the elevation up and down is something like Everest two or three times, and it's not much in, in one day, okay. and or it's just five in a row, so it might be over two days. There's a, there's a documentary on it, but... Uh, Nick, who who done it, he's on the coaching team with me, and like he's in the documentary. I think he came up second or third, but you have an invite, and then you have something random to have. Like I think there was like a flannel shirt you had to give the the guy or a pair of socks. So when you got like, they want to be in the podcast, then. yeah, they're, they're they're not happy. Dexter got in on Remy's pod, Remy and Tom's podcast, so he likes his claim of fame. Like, he needs to needs to keep that shining. Likes to spot that. Yeah, um, yeah, but now you you're pushing yourself. You go forward once, backward once, forward once, backward once, and then I believe the last one you can choose, mm -hmm. uh, or the, the uh, which rotation you go. So you don't really get a map, but you have to go and find a page in a book. Like your number might be twenty six. So there's books at different places. There's that like orienteering in there as well. Mm -hmm rip out page 26 of each book and then you have to give them back when you get to the the checkpoint but like how much you beat your body up for that like i've like going into a lot of the holistic health there's there's part of me at the moment where i'm just like we get drawn into this stuff 
part of it is peer pressure, but how much is actually going to help our body and hinder it, but you still want to push the limits. It's yeah. finding that balance of what limits can I push without breaking myself. And if I do break myself, how do I come back? I think that's crazy. really interesting when you look at, I think about this sort of stuff a lot, and I think about like why we do the things we do. And I think if you break it down to like nature, it's like one part of us wants to grow, yeah. and that's usually uncomfortable, because you're pushed, like if you think of like a plant growing through soil, it's like, it's, there's, there's resistance, it's pushing through stuff, and that's probably gonna hurt, like train, like lifting weights in the gym, it doesn't feel nice, it's not like, it's not like, it's not pleasurable, no. it's like resistance. We might think it's pleasurable and fool ourselves into it, but yeah. it's painful. Yeah, so, right. so the growth and the adaptation and the adversity and stuff like that, and pushing past our limits is painful, but then also we strive for comfort. So there's like there's two dynamics and the polarities again. So like everything in life is duality, like up and down, mm -hmm. left and right, and stuff like that. Hot and cold. So like you look at life and it's like a balance again. Am I being too comfortable? So this morning there's a we've been doing the ocean dips every morning, every yeah. every Wednesday at Sea Paul and Beach. So we've been doing like five K run just up and down the beach and then go in the ocean and do like the cold water immersion stuff, which is amazing. So I've been doing it every week. And this morning, I didn't get to sleep till God mid God midnight last night. I was supposed to be up at half five. And the night before I hardly slept, I didn't have to sleep very well. So I went to bed last night and I was so rushed with everything. And I woke up at half five and I thought to myself, I really don't want to go today. But I felt that every week and done it because I know that, you know, outside of your comfort zone, um, growth is, doing the things you don't want to do, but you do them anyway, all sorts yeah. of stuff. But this morning I woke up and I thought, I really should probably listen to my body and not do it. But then I felt the peer pressure of, oh, you know, like, yeah. I don't want to not go. It'll be better if I get up and go. But it was actually kind of productive for me going today because I needed to actually catch up on sleep. So it's just trying to find that balance of, like, where am I pushing it too much? Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. need to have, sometimes you need comfort. You need to rest, you need to sleep. It's like saying, I don't want to sleep every night because I don't never want to be comfortable. Yeah. It's delusional. Hashtag team no sleep or whatever. Yeah, it's delusional. Yeah. And people who are like doing the best in life or the, the most sort of like the healthiest people and the people we admire the most, they'd probably prioritise their sleep and their well being. So it's not about burning burning out, it's more about having that conscious relationship between the scales of am I continuously pushing past my limitations and trying to grow, but also noticing when I need to recover and be balanced and sort of restore myself. So today I didn't go. Yeah. I would have loved to go on the sea this morning, but I didn't go, and I feel like I don't need to prove it to anybody because I know within myself I've done the best thing for me. Yeah, I think that this is something I've struggled with over the years. Of, like, I've gone from that really pushing yourself mm -hmm. or going and doing like 50 miles on the bike and then going and training straight afterwards. Mm -hmm. And then, like, there's a, a voice that goes into your head sometimes of, like, well, am I just kidding myself? Am I being lazy? Yeah. Should I be doing this? And it's actually like, Sometimes I found the voice of other people has actually got into your head more. Um, because especially between guys, like we might joke about stuff, but there's a reason we joke about it, and that does actually kind of grate on it. Mm -hmm. Like, so, oh, you should have done this, you should have done that. Um, it's something I've actually struggled with, with like the sea dips and stuff, that I've done like the cold showers, the ice baths and mm -hmm. things, and I've had sea dips in the past. Mm -hmm. But knowing, and I think I said it, did I say it in the, like, in the group or something like? I think I said no. I said it to Ollie um, when we were at one of the meetings, and we were saying about it. And I just said like, at the moment, my morning routine is non-negotiable, and getting into that routine, also being in a relationship where you get up like with myself and doing my thing, then we walk the dogs, and then I go train and stuff like that. That it's not it would be thing. selfish. Yeah. And then I thought, well, is that an excuse? Mm. Well, no. It is actually the truth of what it is, mm. and it's knowing that we can make excuses for ourselves but there are legitimate excuses yeah uh, and also where we are in our life by 100 percent. it's just owning that as well yeah like if you know within yourself know like it's not just about me if you woke up and you were single and you had no pets and you just worked you'd be like and you're like oh actually no i kind of need to do my journal routine it's like yeah you could be flexible on that yeah once yeah but it's different when different once people week, are involved yeah. and stuff like that and sometimes it, it i mean it's like people with families and stuff like not everyone's like operating from the same set of conditions so it's yeah man it's like me today like i woke up and it's like i could have just gone but i just thought drive there go in get in i'm like i'm actually trying to who am i trying to prove this to i don't need to prove it to anybody yeah and owning that 
despite what anyone says. Could have got like, I could have got some like banter or something. But no one said anything. It's fine. Yeah, and, and I think that we we look at this is where. Okay, the call I had beforehand was like an hour and forty five, so mm -hmm. there was a lot that spoken about it. But um, like talking with, with my clients, there's a couple of women that I work with together, and we were talking about this time of year of going out and actually just telling people about what you're actually trying to achieve with your health. Yeah. Because, and even in relationships, when you're actually trying to do something with your health and what it means to you, mm -hmm. if you know that you're not comfortable in your body and this is what you want to do to change it, if you have that explanation and you talk to your partner or something about it, that they're usually going to be a bit more understanding. But we're worried about that. Mm -hmm. And you're always going to get that peer pressure because a lot of, well, I say always, most of the time you get that peer pressure because a lot of the people aren't comfortable in what options they're choosing themselves. 100%. Especially with alcohol being a big one. 100%. Like, they're like, yeah, you need to drink. How can you not actually not? Or how can you enjoy a night if you don't drink? Uh, and it's the point of the finger. I found a hell of a lot. If let's say me and you are living together and we both are like sedentary and we don't really exercise, we don't really care. We we, we all the takeaways a lot. And we watch a lot of Netflix or something. Just, just case study for example. Yeah. And I said, you know what? I feel like shit. I'm actually going to try and join the gym in January. I'm going to go join up as a deal on, and I'm going to maybe invest in the PT because I don't feel great. And I kind of put it to you and go, that's what I'm going to do. Do you want to do it with me? Or like, that's what I'm going to do. That's instantly, your mind's going to go to, what does that say about me? Like, oh, fuck. Yeah. Oh, fuck. Like, does this, is this the end of the takeaway, the Netflix yeah. chills we have? And it's like, it's just natural human behavior. I'm sure everyone kind of knows this by now. But like, you're going to like crab in the bucket. If you don't feel, it'll make you think, fuck, am I making the right choices? And now you're highlighting something which I'm ashamed of because you're about to make a big like, majestic life change and it highlights my own insecurities but I can't do things like that and I'm going to tell you to shut the fuck up and don't try to change yeah. do you know what I mean so it's like yeah it's really difficult and I think you've got to be able to vocalise what you want for yourself and in your life and in your relationships and things like that and, and own it really yeah it's pretty nice when you think of it like that so right go back to you <laughs> okay what next I don't know where what haven't we spoken about um, we, we actually got like, cut off Talking about what you're doing, you got out of it. What, what you What's happening doing? in the next year? Oh, okay. Okay, I have to have a firm, a firm it. Okay, cool. You're going to be crushing the PT stuff in, in a positive way. Yeah, I think exactly. I think I basically I'm starting back as a personal trainer, David, David Lloyd in Norwich, and I used to work there a couple of years ago. Didn't really maximise my potential as a personal trainer there, probably because I was probably more focused on like what do I want out of my life, who who am I, all this sort of stuff, and it's very difficult to then. If you know you're a PT, you know that's your tunnel vision, you'll build a massive business because that's what your business But I was like, I craved to go abroad and go and experience stuff and stuff like that. So I wasn't really um, tunnel vision on it when I was last there. And then this time going back, I kind of have a little bit more of a, a direction in terms of what I'm trying to do and what, move, what direction I'm moving in. I think fundamentally the umbrella is mental health. Leaning more towards men's mental health, but it doesn't have to be restricted to just that. I just find that... I feel like I can be a, a fairly good conduit to other guys. It's almost like I'm going first with stuff because of the amount of people that have reached out and said stuff. And it's like, wow, people really, people really just need like a little bit of, I don't know, a little bit of not encouragement, but someone to just sort of say something which just triggers something for them. And it's, um, so I think the mental health side of things and just people wanting to be the sort of best version of themselves or the healthiest, happiest. And I think that there's no more important time to do that than obviously this year of the pandemic highlighting all of our sort of weaknesses um, in all areas, really, you know, society, individually, our relationships, our jobs, everything. It's been a great year to sort of take a good hard look at the reality of everything mm -hmm. and um, realise the only thing you can control is yourself. I mean, when your travel is restricted. Sort of reactions to everything. Yeah, like people have been on furlough for months and they can't actually do another job, but they can't do their own job and they're just getting paid. It's like, well, okay, well, I'm just, It's I good can't. for the first six weeks or so. Yeah, and after that, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think fundamentally we, we've probably all realised that by, by the end of this year that the only thing we can really control is our, ourselves to an extent, you know. Um, we can do that to the best we can. So I think going back to David Noyes and PT, I'm going back with a different perspective as I'm obviously a very different person to two years ago, which I hope we all are in two years' time. Um, so I'll be dabbling in that and then trying to maintain the other projects I've got going on, like Bro Society, try and run that. I like the weekly ocean dips, um, any other challenges I've got going on. I like to do the art. I've got 
an actual exhibition coming up in January, which is oh, nice. another imposter syndrome thing, which Jake thankfully pushed me towards doing. Um, just a little local one. Um, Where are you doing that? Moorish Falafel Bar. Um, down the lanes in Norwich. Okay. Near, near City Hall, basically. Down those little lanes. Yeah, that building over there. Yeah. It's crazy that you can see, like... Yeah. I, I, it's like we're talking about the the view here and, like, going on about the view that sometimes I think, like, I'm like, that castle's been there How many since years the 10th century. Mad. How fucked up is that? Mad. Like, that view, like... <laughs> This house hasn't been here, but that view of that castle and that cathedral. It's been standing erected like that for. You think like, like, the like looking at the lanes and stuff and mm. the churches how around old, there, how old that area is, like all the things. Like the energy and the there. memories and stuff, it's crazy, yeah. man. Like, again, going off on a tangent, but. Yeah, I saw a. Um, there was a guy doing an exhibition in the forum mm -hmm. at the weekend. Mm -hmm. That was really cool art, and it was like abstract, like there was celebrities and. I'm like, I don't want the canvas version of the biggie picture. Like, but I can't afford 700 quid to go and buy a picture at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> like, but there was pictures of him on Instagram, like selling it. Yeah. And there's always a scope for it out there. People yeah. will buy it. If that resonates with them, yeah, why it resonates, resonates. Yeah. I think for me, it's very personal, the reasons I'm doing it. And then if, it, if anyone looks at it and thinks, oh, it's cool, or like they like it, bonus. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I think, I think the last one I've done, it's now actually in the arena. So um, the arena... The, the guys there have been putting up some like people who've just been doing local art have put it up in there which is nice so that's like the first piece which is outside of my house now and gone out into the world which is quite that's cool from cool. a symbolic point of view um, and just see where it goes man like if, if it's, it's changed my life so much in terms of getting in touch with that side of myself that anything that happens externally I don't care yeah. and if someone buys one one day cool great it'd be really mad to, to, to sort of realise that that's possible but that's not why I'm doing it so, um, but I'm going to do a little exhibition and see what that's like and just sort of dabble in something which is outside the comfort zone. Again, it's another thing. It's not a physical pursuit. It's more of like a societal kind of hobby, interest, pursuit. Um, yeah, I think, I honestly don't know what's going to happen next year, but I'm just going to keep following my gut and keep following the signs that seem to sort of lead me in the direction I've gone in. And uh, when I look at my life objectively now and the people I'm connected to and the things I'm doing and the things I have done and chances I'm getting, I'm really, really appreciative of it. I think it is because I've been sincerely on this journey for a while and, and the fruits are starting to show. Yeah. And like there's that quote like, fruit doesn't grow, like the, the day you plant the seed isn't the day you eat the fruit, thing. Yeah. And you've got to buy the, build the, or grow the tree before you even get the fruit, fruit to actually. Yeah, so it's that man, really. And I think like, I don't want to be too specific with it because I don't want to be like rigid with, I want this to happen and then it might not happen. But at the same time, I do realise the importance of affirming externally, vocally, what you want to happen. So I think I'll be PTing um, or at least helping people um, through mental health and phys physical health and things like that. Are you just doing that at David Lloyd or are you going to do it just, outside? No, I'm just going to, whilst I'm working at David Lloyd, I, won't, I can't do it anywhere else just due yeah. to like, the cor corporation and stuff. So I'll be doing that at David Lloyd, which is cool. And then just trying to do um, other stuff outside of it, like Bro Society, try and get some events in. We're looking to maybe do like, in the long term, looking at like retreats and stuff or like weekends away and stuff. So instead of just being like an evening of a chat, it's like, you know, go to nature and like camp in the summer or something, go around the fire, go in the ocean, just have some real time outside of the sort of matrix in which we live in and just reconnect with ourselves and nature and things like that, which is what is really benefited me during the summer, being outside a lot and... Um, because at the end of the day, we are just animals as well. We're not designed to be living in these boxes within boxes within boxes. Exactly. Not touching physical earth, just man-made materials sort of all the time, desensitised from our roots, essentially. So, yeah, who knows, man? We shall see. We're, it's finding out, like, what's going to happen next week. Literally, well, yeah. It's Christmas Eve going to happen at the moment. Yeah. Like, all that sort of stuff. Like, what's going to happen next week, let alone next year and... All that. It's, I think like, even looking back, if we'd have said, what, the 15th, 16th of December, mm. if you'd have said 2019, sitting here a year ago, yeah, like, it was crazy. I think the stuff that's happened this year, even without lockdowns, if I'd have said that these things are happening, these aren't going to happen. Like, it's nuts. Mm -hmm. um, what are you actually planning to come back? Yeah, but yeah. it all wrapped up right at the last minute. Yeah. So I was due to come down and yeah. stuff. Yeah. So I think I made the decision in like January time that I wanted to come home 
because um, I just felt so far away from home and isolated with family. But you hadn't in just, December? Sorry? You hadn't at this time in December? What do you mean, sorry? To make that decision to come back early? Yes, yeah, so about, about a year. Yeah. About, literally about a year ago, I started to sort of... Well, it was on my mind for a while at work every day, thinking I'm just working and living now. I'm not really exploring. Nothing's yeah. new. The novelty's worn off. Is it what is my life out here, the quality of my life, better in New Zealand than it would be at home around family and things like that? So I made a decision to come home and then story of coming home is quite stressful because um I was due to come fly home in March, I think it was like twenty third of March, and I was about twelve days before my flight and my brother was hammering me at home being like, You need to come home, you need to come home. It's getting so big in uh in England, like yeah. COVID spreading and I'm in New Zealand which is like the la- last place it really touched. Yeah. So isolated from everything that's going on in the world. And now it's been declared now that it's COVID free. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah really they've done really well. I think it's a lot easier with like five million population than like whatever sixty six million UK. Yeah. But um and strip the borders and stuff. But I think at the time I was very blase and like, oh I'll get home, I'll be fine, I don't really want to book another flight, I can just I've got twelve days left, let me enjoy it. I don't want to rush leaving my whole life and all the people and the relationships I had at the time. I don't want to rush away from that and I wanna be a bit sentimental about it. It's such a big thing to move from the other side of the planet to the other. It's not yeah. like a day trip. It's a whole day just to get back. Just yeah, exactly. Such a flight. Yeah. So um, I think I was due to come home. Family were pressuring me to come home. and I didn't really listen to that advice because it didn't seem real to me. And then I went and reluctantly to a travel agent about 12 days prior to my booked flight and said, um, is my flight going to go? I just want to check because I've been badgered all the time at home. I don't really want to ask her, but is it going to go? And she actually said to me, it's almost guaranteed to be cancelled. You need to book a flight within 48 hours. Wow. Or you well, can't go. And I'm like, fuck. Yeah. So I literally, I was in a relationship at the time. Um, I had a full-time job. I had an apartment. Everything, my whole life structured. All these friends and people that I've met. Um, it'd been my life for like a year and a yeah. half and really ingrained. And um, obviously I, was go- I wanted to go home, but I also loved my experience. But this was really hard to sort of make that decision. And um, I basically had to book a flight in 48 hours time. And I booked one for the Tuesday. And this was the Sunday I went into travel agent. So I had to go into work the next day and basically say, I'm, can today be my last day? It's got to be, because I'm flying tomorrow. Yeah. And then they went in, they said, that's fine. They, they made my resignation earlier, which was great. And they're really good about it. But I had to basically pack up my whole room, all my stuff, sell my room to another person, which I was in the process of doing anyway. And then, I didn't even know flights would go as well because everything was so chaotic at the time. And then COVID spread to New Zealand that day, the exact day that yeah. I was leaving. The, I worked at a gym out there, Les Mills Gym, and they got the announcement that day that New Zealand were going to go into a lockdown in 48 hours' time. Wow. So not only did it spread around the whole world, but it spread to New Zealand the exact day that I was trying to leave to go back. So that spread, and they said, we're going to leave, uh, we're shutting today anyway. So I went off, left earlier, packed all my room up. Had to the girl then who was going to take over my the lease of my apartment then said I can't take over your room because no one's going to take over mine because of COVID. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, fuck, so I've lost the person taking over my room. I've got to pack all my stuff up. I've got to say goodbye to everybody. Um. So I went to bed that night and also Emirates, which I had a flight home with. So I was going to be uh, Wellington in New Zealand to Sydney, Sydney to Dubai, Dubai to London, Heathrow. And then Emirates announced that all of their flights are going to be cancelled for two weeks from Wednesday. So I had to work out when am I landing in Dubai. Oh yeah, damn. What time is it? Does this affect my flight or is this just outbound flights from there? Mine's a connecting flight, does that count? Couldn't get any phone lines. There's only one statement they put out. Twitter's gone mad from travel point of view everywhere. Everyone's checking their flights. I'm like, I'm literally one of millions. I'm not going to get heard here. So I went to bed that night, having packed everything up, thinking, am I going home tomorrow or not? And I'm about to face a four week lockdown in New Zealand if I don't, yep. if I can't go home. Went to bed that night, looked at my app the next day. Those connecting flights had all been cancelled off the app. Oh, my heart sunk. Because obviously if I didn't get home now, I travel. it seemed like travel could be banned for a year. Who knows what happened? So I left my job, um, left my apartment, was leaving everybody behind and it got cancelled and the door slammed shut. So I had two cancelled flights, got stuck in, um, sort of stuck in New Zealand for four weeks before I could able, I was able to manage to get a, a flight home by the government to getting a loan, which was better than nothing, but it was really, really chaotic, man. Yeah. So coming home when I came back to, to lockdown in New Zealand, uh, sorry, came back to lockdown in the UK, back with family, no job, no car, no life. Great. But you built, start a, again. you built a life already. Yeah, like, yeah man, like, that's like, something I'm proud about. I'm a little yeah. bit now, but I'm grateful for the sort you of chance. You could have just sat and been a victim for ages. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
which is nuts. He's lived with um, a man since 50, hasn't he? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, guys, uh, if, if you are, if you're a member of David Lloyd, obviously, yeah, I'll be back, right back in now, then January time. Recommend going and speaking, speaking with Sam, obviously, like body and mind are massively connected. Mm. Something that I've noticed a lot, and I was very guilty of it when I was training, is that I really focus on the body rather than the mind mm. when I was personal training people. So I think it's very good that you've got that connection mm. and you're not just going to smash someone for a workout and then they did not move for five days. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, not focus on everything else. So, um, cool, thank you for joining me on this. Thanks, and, man. Um, Appreciate it. Yeah, I look forward to having further chats. Yeah, man. Take care. Thank you all for coming. Cool.